Welcome to the Time Bubble Podcast, the only podcast where the guests get to travel in time. And this week, I am joined by Mr. Duncan Elliott. Hello, Duncan. Hello, Jason. How are you? I'm very good. Um, enjoying the nice weather without melting like we were told we were during the last heat wave. I know it's a wonder any of us have survived, isn't it? It is. It is. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, well, thanks for coming on. Um, I'd better tell people a little bit about you. Duncan is a successful HR consultant based in Gloucestershire, and he runs a company called Your HR Director, uh, which I'll put a link to later on for all your HR needs. Um, he helps small and sometimes big businesses and sometimes charities navigate the many pitfalls of HR and employment law. And before this, he had a varied career, ranging from estate agent, youth hostel assistant, college lecturer and management trainer. So um, a lot that you've done there. Yes. I mean, I, I wouldn't have normally mentioned the estate agent bit, um, but it, it is relevant to one of my one of my stories today. But uh, I think a lot of people would rather admit to having been the piano player in a brothel rather than <laughs> having been. And the state agent, well, there you go. It was a, it was short lived, but uh, but it is relevant to uh, one of my one of my days. So I thought, I yes, would, uh, mention oh, it. it's good to mention. Yes, yeah, so there are there are worse things. I mean, traffic wardens, for example, or um, COVID marshals, <laughs> 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 or you know, um, I, I'm sh- sure there are uh, probably some traffic wardens out there. So I, I do apologise to you if I've offended you. <laughs> They're fine, fine people. Yes, wonderful, upstanding um, pillars of the community. (laughs) So uh, have you heard any of my earlier episodes? I have heard all of them. You've heard all of them? Fantastic. I have, yes. Very good. And I've been excited to come on because I think it's a wonderful idea. So, uh, yeah, I've I've heard them all. Oh, well, that's great because normally at this point I have to explain the format for people, but... Quite honestly, um, we're on to episode nine now. So if the people listening don't know by now, well, they'll just have to find out as we go along, won't they? They will. So the format is we are talking about travelling in time, uh, particularly within your own life. So places that you have been that you'd like to go again and famous people and places outside of your own life experience that you might like to visit. To kick off with, I'm going to ask you the first question, which will be the same for questions two or three. If you could go back in time and live a day of your life again, which would you choose? Okay, so a day I would go back to uh, would be a day in the early noughties we're supposed to say aren't we i think uh, we had this dis- <laughs> we had this discussion on the last <laughs> episode i recorded actually and i said i've never felt comfortable with the term the noughties it just doesn't sound right so no. i always so i always say the 2000s but the, the, i do you think the noughties is going to become the accepted term I sadly think- i think it probably is yeah. um i i could say the year two Yes. Uh, or possibly the year three. I can't remember. I think it was the year two. Yes. Um, so I was on holiday on the Mayan Riviera in Mexico. Yes. In uh, one of these all-inclusive hotels, which I wouldn't normally go for, because I'm not really into all-inclusive type things, but because it was Mexico and basically all you could get was all-inclusive, um, I went to an all-inclusive hotel in Mexico. And... On, on that Caribbean side, the weather's lovely. But as you know, it can sometimes absolutely bucket down with rain um, from seemingly out of nowhere. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, well, I haven't, I haven't actually been to that part of the world, but I have been to Hawaii, and it's a very similar sort of thing. When the rain comes down, it is unbelievable. You would never see anything like it in the UK. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I was out for a walk, and... Uh, down by the beach and suddenly it absolutely tipped down with with rain and as luck would have it one of the many bars in this hotel was down by the beach so I ran under the cover of this of this bar and I thought to myself well as it's all inclusive I may as well get my money's worth so I sat down at the bar and I thought I'll have a couple of beers wait for the rain to finish 
uh, and then go back up to the hotel room because it was quite a long walk. It's about half a mile. It was one of these big complexes. So I was having a couple of beers and next to me at the bar was this chap, this American guy, and we got chatting. And time went on and the beer flowed a little bit more than perhaps I'd planned initially. Um, and we were sat there together for a couple of hours. And oh, I think then the cigars came out and, you know, we got on like an absolute house on fire. He was quite an eccentric character, this this individual. He was a um, he was a horse vet from right. He lived in Montana in the States. And uh, he told me that he'd arranged a fishing trip. Um, the following day, and um, would I like to come barracuda fishing with him? Okay. And you know what it's you know what it's like. Things seem like a good idea when you've had a few beers. Yes, I think we probably all uh, got ourselves <laughs> into trouble in that scenario. In fact, we probably still do. Yeah, exactly. And it's all very enthusiastic. Lots of slaps on the back. Yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. see you in the morning. I'll see you in the morning. So, I, anyway, so I get back to the hotel room, and you know the. Night goes, the morning comes, and I think, well, I did say I'd go on this trip, so I better, you know, show willing. But I was thinking, oh, it's going to be, oh, it's going to be really awkward, and you know, I never met him before or anything like that. So, anyway, I turn up, and he's there carrying this huge hold all with him, and he said, well, yeah, come with me down the beach. And he had his, he had his, his girlfriend, not his wife, it was his girlfriend with him, who was British. I'll tell you about her. You know, in a moment but uh so off we walked down the beach now i had the impression that he would booked some organized fishing trip with a fishing company of some kind but no no no. we walked down the beach about half a mile and there was this ancient fisherman with this little wooden boat and you know they're greeting each other and waving and it turned out that he just paid this fisherman to take us out in his boat and i'm thinking okay so you know yeah we get in this boat um, you yeah, know, and his girlfriend gets in as well. And he's older than me. I mean, he's, you know, I'm in my early 50s now, and he would probably have been in his early 50s then. And I was in my, you know, early 30s then. Um, and he had this girlfriend with him. It was very, very nice. And it turned out that she was an ex Playboy bunny girl. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But she, you know, I say, but she was very nice. I'm sure, I'm sure they're all very nice. But uh, so anyway, so off we, off we go in this, in this boat. And it's about eight o'clock in the morning at this point. So you're probably uh, hung over. <clears throat> yeah, a bit, but not too bad. Because <laughs> okay. I say we yeah, you know, we party company in the sort of early evening the night before. So not too right. bad. Not too bad. Uh, and I'm wondering about the contents of this hold all that he's carrying. It's one of these big ones, you know, like a grip that you take for a weekend away, you know, long weekend or something. Yeah. And so, you know, the boat gets going and um unzips this hold all, and inside it is a is a huge plastic bag full of ice which he'd obviously blagged from the hotel guys. And there's probably about 30 bottles of beer in this in this bag. And he just pulls out two, opens them both, and just hands me one. And I'm just thinking, okay, well, it's 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm, we, I'm with a complete stranger in a wooden boat off the coast of Mexico drinking beer. Now, what could possibly, what could <laughs> what possibly, could possibly go, go wrong? wrong? Yeah. yeah, what could possibly go wrong? Now, that's just to set the scene. As it turned out, nothing whatsoever went wrong. We had an absolutely fantastic day. Um, you know, we caught some barracuda. We gave them to the fishermen because we had no you know, means of dealing with them. And we had an absolutely wonderful day. And um, as I said, this guy was a real eccentric, and he was telling us all about his house in Montana. And he 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 spent his summers in Montana, his winters in Florida. Um, lovely guy. And, again, you and I are are of a similar age. And I think, you know, tell me if you recognise this, but, but growing up, one of the things that people would always say about Americans is you only need to be talking to them for about half an hour before they invite you to come and stay with them. Yes. Does that ring a bell? Yeah, it, it does. And uh, perhaps not even just Americans, but uh, I found that in places all over the world that people are generally very hospitable. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, they are indeed. And and he subsequently to this uh, fishing trip, um, we spent a bit of time together for the rest of the holiday and we became what you might call holiday friends for the duration. And then they they flew back to the States a few days later. But he invited me to come over to visit him in Montana. And uh, he had an amazing place, a ranch type 
place and the option was to go hunting and fishing and riding and all these wonderful things. And I'm sure people are guessing what, what I'm going to say next, but I never did it. I never took him up on the invitation because I think being a bit reserved at the time, being British, you just think, oh, these, you know, it's all the heat of the moment. It's just the beer talking. But actually, as I subsequently found out from his girlfriend, who was British and who came back to Britain and we stayed in touch for a while, I found out that, yes, he absolutely did mean it. Um, and we could have gone over to uh, the States, to Montana, and had an absolutely wonderful time. Um, and it taught me a lesson that I think uh, Commander Potts from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang said this. Yeah. Um, you should never say no to adventures. Um, and and I think it's taught me a lesson. That, and, and the one thing I would change about that day was that I would have said yes to that adventure and I would have gone and had a lovely time. And I didn't, and and I regret it. And uh, But it has taught me a lesson that you should never, you know, there's a kind of a generosity and acceptance, isn't there, sometimes. And I think if, you, if you're offered something genuine, you should take it. Uh, and I didn't. And no. that's my fault. No, I, I quite agree. I mean, there's that thing isn't there they say that people on um their deathbeds only regret the things that they didn't do and i have to say you know just thinking about your story i can think of many situations in the past where i have been asked to do things particularly when i was younger and sometimes it would be i don't really know this person i i feel slightly this is stepping outside of my comfort zone so I'm not going to do it. I mean, some often, many times I did do it. But when I do think back now, I I think probably, yeah, those those were missed opportunities. And yeah, OK, occasionally things might go wrong. But I'm a lot more open to these ideas now, strangely enough. Um, but now I've got a family and commitments and stuff, so I can't just hair off around the world or do whatever I want, which I could when I was younger, and I probably didn't do as much of it as I should have done. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's, you know, I guess a, an element of wisdom comes with age, doesn't it? And uh, and yes, what you've just said pretty much encapsulates how I, how I felt. You know, you just feel a bit awkward and a bit strange, but uh, as I said, in hindsight... Um, it was the wrong thing, but you know, yeah. you live and learn. Yes, we do, um, and uh, we have to hope that we get to the point in life where we've learned enough to make the right decisions before um, we're completely feeble and old. <laughs> don't, yeah. uh, <laughs> before we can't it's too do, late, we can't do anything anymore. <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. So, okay, well, let's let's move on. Tell us about your second day you'd like to go back to. Okay, now. Uh, this is a little bit of a sad story. It's an interesting story, but it's a bit sad as well. Um, and again, just a bit of scene setting to begin with. Um, so I I left school at 16 because I didn't want to be in school anymore. And I did my A-levels at a college, like a lot of people choose to do. Yes, and I did the same. Yeah, I, I, I was very, very successful in completely cocking up my A-levels. Um, yes, well, I had this, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I did pass <laughs> my A-levels, but... Um, it would have helped if I hadn't spent the first five of the six terms in the pub. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, my story, but I wasn't as successful as you, so I ended up I ended up cocking up my A levels, and so I was, I was, and of course, this is the late nineteen eighties. The unemployment is over three million. The 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 housing market w- was at that time undergoing a bit of a boom. So for youngsters like us, the prospect of getting on the housing ladder and all that was pretty much impossible. Um, and out I popped like a cork in the sort of summer of 1988 with nothing to show for my two years at college apart from a girlfriend and little else. Uh, and we split but, up, obviously, you know, though, um, not that long at, after. From what I recall of being that age, having a girlfriend um, at 18 was kind of like the be all and end all of everything, wasn't it? It, was, uh, it was certainly yeah. was for me. At yeah. The time. yeah. It's a rite of passage, isn't it? Yeah. So, and and my family were quite concerned and you know, wanted me to get a steady job for various reasons. Families always want you to get a steady job, don't they? Yeah. Um, or generally. And so I was pretty much um, persuaded. I won't say coerced, but but 
you know, because I wasn't coerced, but I was persuaded to apply to join the Ministry of Defence, which was based at the old Empire Hotel in Bath, because I lived in a village not that far from Bath or between Bath and Bristol at the time. So I, I applied to join the civil service at the lowest possible clerical grade you could get, which I think was called clerical assistant or something. Yeah. Um, and the, yeah, the salary was something like four and a half thousand a year or something like that. Um, but you could buy a pint of beer for under a quid in those days. So, you know, just to put things into perspective. Yes, it was about 80p but, um, when I started, yeah. I think. Yeah, not that my life revolves around drinking beer, but uh, you know, it, it, it's it, you know, it's... put it into perspective. <laughs> well, I remember you could buy you could buy a gallon of petrol, twenty cigarettes, and a pint of beer for approximately the same price. Yeah, uh, but there you go. Yeah, so so again, it is quite a long story. So I'll try and keep it reasonably succinct. So so I I had the prospect in the in the late summer of that year that I was going to join the civil service at the Ministry of Defence in Bath. In the meantime, I got a job in a pub behind the bar, which I would highly recommend to any young person to do because I think it's a it's it's pretty character building. And I got a job in a very old fashioned country pub, which was in the middle of nowhere, and it was always full of farmers who drink about ten pints of Courage Best and then drive their tractor home, you know, at ten o'clock at night. Um, it was the kind. I remember once I borrowed a shotgun because I was invited to go clay pigeon shooting. And uh, one of the farmers said, oh, I'll lend you a shotgun. So I said, okay, thanks. And so he came in the pub carrying a shotgun in the, you know, about eight o'clock at night. And it wasn't broken. It wasn't in a gun slip. It was literally, he just walked in the pub carrying a side-by-side shotgun. And he just reached it over the bar to me. And it was like one of those scenes from a cowboy film where you sort of, you know, you got the, you sort of put the shotgun under the bar. Okay. It was um, it was quite a, an interesting place. So, yeah. um, so I was working in this pub, and I was due to start at the at the civil service um, a few weeks time. And a lady, middle aged lady in her sort of midish fifties, used to often call into the pub. And as a as a good friendly barman, I would I would chat to her. And it turned out that she was an estate agent, and she had her own small estate agency business in Bath. And just in passing one day, I said to her, oh, have you got any jobs going? And she said, oh, no, no, I haven't. Uh, but then a few weeks later, she said, um, you know, were you serious about that, what you said about uh, about jobs? And I said, well, yeah, I suppose I was. And she said, well, I've been watching how you interact with customers and how, how, you, uh, how you are with people, and I might, have a, I might have an opportunity for you. And my mind was made up instantly. It was it was I knew what I was going to do and I knew I was going to take that job because I didn't want to go and work for the civil service no. because I knew it, it would be hideously boring. So um, I ended up going to work for her instead. And it was a complete disaster. The property market had crashed completely in the August of 1988. Uh, for various reasons, and there was basically no business at all. So I just sat in the office basically doing nothing. Um, and she, as it turned out, was a had some problems with alcohol and depression, and she would often go away for a few days and disappear and not come to the office. And um, things got to a point where I was quite worried about her. And I still worked in the pub at the time because I didn't earn very much money. I earned about 65 quid a week. I think that was my wages. So I still worked in the pub. And I was quite worried about her. I wasn't quite sure what would happen, but I just had this free-floating worry, that this sense of foreboding. And okay. it was a Friday night, and I was working in the pub. And obviously, just to remind listeners, this was way before mobile phones or anything like that. So she rang me at the pub um, during my Friday night shift, and she said, uh, "Oh, I'm going away with friends for a few days. I might be, I might not be in on Monday, but here's my next door neighbour's phone number, just in case you need anything." And I thought, "Okay, all right. Well, that's you know." I, I took the number down and I put the phone down, and I carried on with my shift at the pub. And I thought, well. 
It's a bit strange, you know. Yeah, it's quite an odd thing, isn't it? Why would yeah. You, why would you give a, a neighbour's number? It hmm. doesn't make sense, does it? No. No, and it didn't make much sense to me either. And she didn't turn up at work on the Monday, and she didn't turn up at work on the Tuesday. And I went down to her house, knocked on the door, and there was no there was no answer. And I had this terrible feeling that something awful had happened. Um, and as it turned out, it had. Later on that Tuesday afternoon, I rang the neighbour and I said, look, she's given me your number. She's not come to work. Can you maybe see if she's OK? And I didn't hear anything back. I didn't get a phone call back. So I rang back in a couple of hours time and spoke to the neighbour and she was in a panic. And this policeman came on the phone and informed me that my boss was dead. And she'd been found with an empty bottle of brandy and a lot of empty pill bottles. I don't know what the pills were, but she had effectively you know, drank a bottle of brandy and taken a lot of pills and had died and committed suicide. That must have been awful for you to deal with. I mean, did she leave a note or at all or Apparently she did leave a note, but I still to this day don't know what the contents of the note were. Okay. And the the reason why I'm mentioning this, because it's not necessarily a day I would want I would want to relive, but I've I've managed to reconcile with myself the fact that I was only 18, so practically a boy, and it yep. wasn't my responsibility to save her but because I had that feeling of foreboding on that Friday night and I thought something's wrong something's wrong I just if I could go back to that night I would just I probably would have phoned the neighbor that Friday night and said look I'm really worried about her I think something might be up but if it's for what it's worth I don't blame myself I'm completely reconciled with it and i i have a belief that if somebody is genuinely determined to take their own life there's they're going to do it yeah it's interesting us so many things to come to mind to to say about it really um bearing in mind what you said obviously the the business was probably doing badly because of the property market crash and she'd been drinking a lot do you do you i often think we you know people talk about suicide and that often it's a spur of the moment thing that somebody in a very dark place makes the decision sort of on that particular day but from what you said do you think it was something that she'd maybe been planning yes i do and i think that phone call to me on the friday night was a way of saying goodbye yeah do you think um, it was because it, it, from what you describe, it doesn't sound like a cry for help to me. It sounds like she'd already made a decision at that point. Which yeah, is I why think so. She wanted the neighbour to to find her, I suppose, eventually. Because yeah, maybe, she did. Did the neighbour have a key? Yeah, the neighbour had a key. Yeah. Um and I think the last thing she would have wanted is for me to find her. I, mean, I I yeah. didn't have a key, so I wouldn't have been able to. But and of course, in it was me that was instrumental in her being found because I raised the alarm. But um, but yeah, I think it was planned. I mean, she was single; she'd had a you know, she wasn't a very happy person. Yeah, you know, it was a real shame. Um, and as I said, I, I you know I don't blame myself at all. Um, no. And I think my eight, I need to be kind to my eighteen year old self with all yes. these years of perspective. And as and as I said, whether I whether if I'd intervened on that Friday night, it might not have made any difference at all. It may have just postponed the inevitable. But, yes, um, it's just something that I would do if I could go back. Yeah. I would do it, but it doesn't. I'm okay with it. It's yeah. you know, but it's no, it's a I, difficult one. From what you've said, I I would have come to exactly the same conclusion. So you know, I think you've you've obviously come to terms with it. So yes, I have. So. Apologies to the listeners, but you know no. it's it, this is all about thinking carefully. Yeah, about the no, past, I mean the, the whole the whole idea of the, this podcast is that 
you know, it's completely open. We can have happy stories, sad stories, things we'd have done differently or days we'd just like to do again. It's uh, it's an open format, really. So having said that, um, <laughs> on your third day, hopefully a, a slightly more cheerful tale. Yeah, a very cheerful tale. Um, uh, the third day would be my wedding day, um, which uh, was absolutely lovely. And I would like to go back and relive it all again. Excellent. Funny enough, you're the first person I think that has chosen their wedding day, which is surprising considering how many we've had. But so tell us what happened. Um, well, it, it was a fairly ordinary wedding day in the sense that we went and we got married and had a had a party afterwards. Um, we were lucky in a way because one of our, our friends, um, I won't name where he used to work, but put it this way, his ex-boss, you would have addressed them as your grace. Oh, okay. And I will leave it. I will leave it. I'll put it no stronger than that. Um, and he he was the butler for this individual. Um, and so our friend laid on some very fancy um, butlerish things for us um, at our wedding, which was very good. As uh, as Bertie Worcester once that would have said, he he butled with the best of them. <laughs> so. Excellent. So that was really good. And um, yeah, so we had a fantastic day. And um, and I think that your wedding day goes so quickly and, and it's a bit of a whirlwind. And it, it it would just be nice to just go back and just, you know, drink it all in for a second time. Um, and, I, and I think the only thing I would change about it was I think I we got married in a registry office and I think I would have got married in a church, um, which is the one thing I would have done differently, which makes no material difference to the, the fact that we got married or the, or the reception or anything else. But I just think that's the only thing I would have changed. I would, I would have got married in a church. Yeah. That's all. There's something wonderfully traditional about a church wedding, whether you'd be re religious or not, because that's where, you know, everybody would have got married, you know, up until, a couple of centuries well i don't know when registry office weddings started but i'm I'm pretty sure you know go back a couple of hundred years and more or less everybody would have married in church wouldn't they yeah they yeah they would you know church or chapel or you know the the baptist the methodist whatever it happened yeah. to be but uh but yeah you know so i i thought i would end on a happy one i mean the champagne flowed um you know we had a you know we had a lovely day and um it's yeah, there's not really much more to tell about that one it's i know i've taken quite a while telling my first couple but uh but it was just it's yeah. just a happy you know a happy story and i would love to just go back and relive it and no yeah, that's good and, uh, the yeah. stories don't have to be of equal length and, uh, <laughs> and oh, i try good. and keep i try and keep within a 40 minute zoom call so uh, yeah. uh if the first two take up quite a lot of time i'm delighted that the third one's a bit short because it gets <laughs> us back on track so um okay well we'll move on to the the second part which is where we sort of start to talk about some other things and one of the questions this is probably my favorite question actually is that if you could go back through time to any place or time and step into someone else's shoes for a day who would that be i would like to step into the shoes of ian fleming in jamaica on the day he finished his first james bond novel which was, as most people probably know, is Casino Royale, and that was in 1952. Yes, wonderful. Yes, and um, yes, because he, he, he did he actually live in Jamaica at the time? I know he, he spent a lot of time there, didn't he? He he negotiated a deal with his bosses at Kemsley Newspapers, where he could have two months off a year in the winter in this country. So he would go to Jamaica for two yeah. months to his house, which, as some people know, was called Goldeneye. And which they named one of the films. After. Which they named one of the films, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he would write the novels in those two months. And he would yes. come back, he would fly back, and in his attaché case or whatever it was he had, he would have the manuscript of the latest James Bond novel. Wow, yeah. I mean... Casino Royale itself isn't set in Jamaica, but I remember, is it Live and Let Die? Was that the second one he wrote? That That's the one that is set in Jamaica, isn't it? Uh, it's... No, no, is it Live and Let Yeah, I think it is, yeah. No, actually, no, Doctor No is the one that's, uh, that's the first one. The, yes. You're probably confusing it because the film of Live and Let Die is, I think, set in Jamaica. But no, Live and Let Die is mostly set in New York, actually. Uh, yeah, because the, the, I know that, well, the, the film's not only 
didn't come out in the same order but a lot of them were completely different to the i mean moonraker is practically a different a completely different story to the, the book isn't it oh completely actually i tell a lie let me yeah, correct myself. The first part of Live and Let Die is set in New York, but actually it does move to Jamaica later on in the story. So, yeah, you're right about yeah, that. Yeah, because I it remember does. all that. It's the one with all the voodoo stuff. and, uh, and uh, Yeah, and the buried treasure, Captain Morgan's treasure yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just, I just, I just would, would, you know, the life that Ian Fleming had in Jamaica where he, yeah. he could go swimming and snorkeling it, on the beach outside his house. I can just imagine him having his... You know his martini or his yeah. well his his drink of choice was um, I think pretty much whiskey and soda more than anything else. Um, but his you know I, I can just imagine him finishing with his typewriter, filing away the manuscript, going down for a swim, enjoying a few drinks yeah. in the lovely Jamaican you know summer you know of that time and I, and I think that would be a lovely a lovely place to visit and spend the day as him. On that on that very day, I think that'd be lovely. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, he had such a way of bringing those stories to life and making that world seem real. And um, I, I remember reading all, devouring the James Bond books when I was probably about fourteen or fifteen. And of course, most people now they think of James Bond, they think about the cinema, but the books um, were what really made James Bond for me, for sure. Yeah, me too, absolutely, and also. You know, remember, rationing was still happening in the early 50s. And so yeah. the way that Ian Fleming would lavishly describe all the meals and all the drinks, that was inaccessible to the majority yeah. of people in those days. And so I think that, I mean, Ian Fleming once said, um, you know, I think the sun is always shining in my books. Yeah. And when you when you look, they generally always are set in a in in somewhere where it's warm or the weather's nice and and there's this feeling of, sort of post-war, I mean, I know there's obviously the Cold War themes in the early books uh, yeah. you know, to some extent, but, 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 but yeah, they were fantastic. I loved them. And I read them at a similar age to you. I think I was probably 16 and I probably finished all of them. Me too. They were just, um, just great. Okay. We've got a few minutes left. So last question, is there anywhere else in history that you'd like to visit? Yeah, I've chosen this one because of a family connection, actually, because there's lots of places I'd like to go, including the Battle of Trafalgar and the Battle of Waterloo, which have both been covered by previous guests on your <laughs> yeah. on your podcast. But I would like to go back to the day that a photo reconnaissance picture was identified, and that was in the latter part of 1943, and it was a photograph which showed a very distant image of the V1 flying bomb on a ramp at, yes. the, air, at the experimental airfield at Pinamunda. Yes, I, I've seen the picture. And yes. Um, it, 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 it's not particularly clear, is it? You'd have to know no. what you were looking for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you would. And the, uh, the photograph was identified by quite a famous analyst, a lady called Constance Babington-Smith, who wrote various books and was quite well known. Um, and the implication of that photograph was that it confirmed that Hitler was working on a new Nazi uh, terror weapon, which hadn't been proven until that point. And the family connection is that uh, it was a, a relative by several generations removed, of course, that it was a relative of mine that actually took that photograph. Wow. Wow. That's uh, a good good claim to fame, or isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, on the Cornish side of my family. On my mum's yeah. side, it's a relative. His name was his rank at the time was squadron leader. His name was John Merrifield. Yeah, and um, yeah, he 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 was a a very successful photo reconnaissance pilot. First in Spitfires, then in the Mosquito. And okay. the photograph was actually taken almost accidentally because he was supposed to have been taking photographs after a bombing raid in Berlin, but there was cloud cover over Berlin. So he thought, well, I'll go somewhere else. And he went somewhere else and took some pictures there. And then he thought, okay, well, I'll try Pinamunda, just see if I can get any pictures of that. And he used up the last six minutes of his film over Pinamunda. And that was when he took that very famous photograph. Yeah. Yeah, that's that, that's excellent. I often think that, you know, when we talk about the war, 
much of it is focused on you know the actual military campaigns but the the intelligence work and the information gathering and, and the people like uh, like you mentioned constant babington smith beavering away behind the scenes here in the uk to find out what's going on and crack codes and and all those sort of things was probably as you know as important to the war effort as any military campaign yeah exactly i mean look at bletchley park and things like that and i mean the files on bletchley park weren't released as you know you know till fairly recently and it's um yeah it's amazing um you know everyone everyone did their bit in their own way didn't they yeah yeah they did um and it's obviously it's before our time and probably before most people's time now we were talking in the last podcast about how eventually things fade out of living memory but you'll you'll probably remember as i do from you know from being a kid there were plenty of sort of granddads and people around then that had fought in the first world war who, yeah who absolutely told, yeah who, who told me all sorts of stories uh and those people are, are no longer with us so i think it's very important we keep the memories of of these things alive absolutely yeah yeah i totally agree so there we go. That's my my time traveling anecdotes for you. Yeah, no, they they they've been great. I, I mean, I didn't say a lot because I, I just like to let the the guests talk. So, um, thank you very much for coming along. Well, it's been a pleasure, and as I say, um, you know, sorry you couldn't get a word in edgeways, but I was conscious <laughs> of the time, so I was trying to be as brief. But it's it's difficult when you want to include enough detail for people to get some context but uh but yeah, yeah. I, hope people, I hope people have enjoyed it there's always things i want to try and get in as well uh, I, I had a little factoid you probably know this and people probably know this anyone but did you know um sean connery wasn't the first person to play james bond do you know who played him on the radio in the 1950s i'll have a pee please bob yeah yes indeed. <laughs> that, that was going to be my clue if you didn't know it. yeah the, the, it's uh, all my whole memory of bob holness growing up from uh was seeing him on blockbusters and uh, yeah it's hard to imagine anybody that would less likely to be james bond but there you go he was there you go absolutely days. so uh, on that note we'll leave you and um we'll be back again next week thank you very much duncan Thank you, Jason. It's been a pleasure. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye.